I remember when Gerard Mayo, my friend and and and, and former colleague, he left. He left to just start coaching. I don't know why he left the media to start coaching. <laughs> but I remember when Gerard Mayo was drafted. Like, day one, you said, hey, my last name's Mayo. You guys have any ideas? I thought <laughs> at that point, I thought you would have been doing a commercial that way back in, in 2008. What what took you so long, Mayo? Man, I've been calling Hellman's. I've been calling them for like 10 years, bro. They, they were trying to do it until now. Everything happens in the right timing, so I'm good. Hey, man, it's good to see you. Really good to see you. Uh, your, coach, good to see you your coach, Gerard Mayo, I know your name came up uh, in some uh, head coaching interviews. I don't know if you went on any interviews, but just just tell us about that that process of going from player to businessman, media man, and then back on the uh, on the coaching circuit. Yeah, you know, as a player, I, I've always been interested in other things, and um, you know, business was one of those things. So when I retired, I ended up joining uh, United Health Group. I uh, did that for three years. Ended up being vice president of business development. But I, I always had this itch of getting back and uh, developing players or developing people, I should say. Not only players, because I'm, I'm an investor, just like you said, as well. I like to develop uh, entrepreneurs as well and help people really see who they can't see for themselves. And, you know, it's been a great transition for me. Uh, the, the interview process was great uh, for me. But I think it's important that we that we recognize the frustrations that you know, B. Flo is talking about that. Leslie Frazier is talking about that. Eric B. Enemy is is talking about. Like those are true frustrations. Things that we've known have gone on for a long time. And in saying that, I would say, from from my perspective, because I am a younger coach, I'm going into year four. I looked at these as opportunities to really get in front of another group and really sharpen my sword. And not only was I being interviewed, but I was also interviewing these teams. Mm. So that that was the type of confidence that I had going into those interviews. Now, look, I hope I hope you guys ask those teams. I knocked those interviews out of the park. Now, it is what it is. Whoever they decide to go with, obviously, I wasn't the guy, so I lost that one. But I did walk away from those interviews with, uh, you know, with some learnings, some learnings that it, it, and I would be crazy if I didn't use that the next cycle around. And so that's the way I kind of approached yeah. it. The, the thing about the lawsuit, not only was it um – a history lesson, a, a thesis, a really very good. comprehensive right. look at the, the history of institutional racism uh, in the NFL. But there were also some specific action steps that seemed re relative or rather reasonable, I should say, not relatively, rather reasonable when it comes to adding transparency um, and accountability to this process. Do you have any ideas? I know, you know, this is your first time Broncos and Raiders uh, on the interview circuit on, as, as a head coach. Um, then Eagles. Then Eagles, oh, Eagles, Eagles, yes, Eagles last yes. year. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's right. Thank you for that. Um, but even as a younger coach, I should say, do you have any suggestions on how uh, the, not only the process but the perspective can be improved so that these very real frustrations that we're talking about can, you know, sooner rather than later uh, start to be addressed. You know, one thing I would say, the, tra the transparency piece is very interesting. And, and some of these teams, they do record the interviews. So it would be interesting to even see, like, like have like a neutral party just sit there and watch all the interviews and come to their own conclusion. But but the realistic re realistically though what we're talking about here it's not just the NFL it's also corporate America as well mm -hmm. where people hire people that look like them. You know and and that's why you know people that are my complexion have a hard time sometimes even breaking through that glass ceiling or even feeling accepted or like you belong. And that's why for a long time I dealt with imposter syndrome. And, but that was also that was also a motivator for me. You know, and I grew up that way. My mom, my grandparents, they always told me, you're gonna have to go above and beyond. So whatever we're talking about right now, our parents, our grandparents have gone through it way worse than what we've gone through. Now, we, and I'm not saying we don't have a long way to go, but I was raised that I'm always going to have to uh, go above and beyond in this regards. Now, as far as the next steps, I kind of break it down. Like if you look at the top of the funnel, it starts with ownership, right? It starts with ownership. There are no black owners in the NFL. 
or in sports, I should say, there are minimal. I don't know if there's Jordan. any black yeah. owner. Yeah, besides Jordan. Yeah. But they're not, they're not a lot, right? And so that's where it starts. At the bottom of the funnel, which I would say we do a good job here in New England where we bring in these minorities and they really end up sticking on. But even in saying that, they they come in, they, they get a chance to kind of bounce around, learn as much as they can, and also build these relationships. This is a relationship business. Yeah. Now, none of our friends are growing up saying, I want to be a GM. Why? Because they're focused on playing, right? But some of these kids who are GMs, they knew early on they didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance to be an NFL player, but they wanted to make it there. And so now I've gone to high school or I was college roommates with a GM of the Eagles. Now I'm up for a coaching job, right? And so we don't have that same, we don't have that in our community. And so how we get to that point, and I would say one thing that is encouraging, I am a half, you guys know me, I'm a half glass full kind of guy, is the GMs, the, the GMs this year, right? When you look at Quasi, when you look at what happened in Chicago, Morocco Brown interviewing with the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. And hopefully that, you know, that progress that they're making at the GM level starts to trickle down into the coaching level, uh, and, you know, get more people of color, more diversity in, uh, in those ranks. And I, I, one more thing I'll yeah, add sure. to this. I, 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 yeah, it, it, when I talk about diversity, I'm not only talking about black and white. I'm talking about diversity of thought. I'm talking about gender diversity. I'm talking about age diversity, right? There are a bunch of different ways, but what happens is people hire people who look like them and who think like them. Yeah. And so they end up being in this echo chamber and they end up, hey, the confirmation bias, they end up asking you a question knowing you're gonna agree with me. Yeah. And see, I don't wanna be around people like that. I wanna be around people who are gonna tell me, I don't see it that way. And to really, to really have me question my own beliefs, no matter what we're talking about. We could be talking about religion. Look, I'm a Christian. I don't just hang out with Christians. I'll tell you what it is right now. Yeah. I hang out with a bunch of different people, right? I'm a football coach. I hang out with a, def a bunch of different people. And so, like, that diversity is important, not just in sports, but also just in our world, in my opinion. That incredible answer. Just wanted to quickly follow up on just on a personal level, the imposter syndrome. When, where, and why did you struggle with imposter syndrome, and how did you work your way through it? Mm. Yeah, so I really, I really, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome really started as a high school football player, right? So I'm in high school. So it started off, I was on JV. I went up to practice with the high school guys and got sent back down real quick to JV. Next year I go up, I end up being a good player. I end up being a four-star player. Uh, four-star linebacker going to the University of Tennessee. Once I get to the University of Tennessee, I'm like, wow, these guys are bigger, faster, and stronger. And I use that imposter syndrome to put that extra work in, right? Extra work in the gym, extra work in the film room. So then I end up getting drafted to a team that won 18 games the year before, right? And I'm like, I was a first-round pick, and I'm still feeling like I just don't belong here. Hmm. I'm not good enough. Right. I'm not good enough. And that's probably something that's been passed down to me from our ancestors as well. Like just that. But I use it as fuel to go forward. Right. And so then when I went into business, I ended up working for a healthcare company. What did I do? I felt like I wasn't good enough. I was a room. I was the youngest by 20 by 20 years. Right. And I was the only black guy in there. And so, and also, so what I did was I joined the board of Boston Medical Center. I really studied up on healthcare, all the blogs, all the books, but it really fueled me to get to where I needed to be. And, you know, I still deal with it now. And even when I do become a head coach, because that day will come, there, will, there will be, there will be a hardworking Gerard Mayo because I don't know how I got here. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, Gerard, hey, you know, I think you will be a head coach, and I've told people that that I know. I said, I, I haven't seen the interview. I know we crushed the interview because yeah. he uh, used to crush it. it on set when we used to work together, and even though I carried him a, a, a few times. <laughs> I had to carry him a few times. No, you did. No, you did. no you I did not. No, he did not. I did not. I, well, did I can not. tell you he no, did not. Sir, no, but, no, but, no, but, I, but, but what I – Hey, but what I will say is, uh, no, I've always looked up to you guys, you know, because you're very articulate and you're able to talk to different groups of people. And where our people get caught up is like, all right, this message is only for black people. Or yeah. they tell their friends, go watch this black movie. But I got to tell my white friends to go watch this black movie, too. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. We got to we got to have the conversation around the black table. Right. It is what it is. All right, we're talking about, you know, George Floyd and things like that. But until we have that conversation happen around the white table, right, right the white dinner table, then we'll start to have real change. Well, uh, that's what I I, and, and this is my mentor. You know, I mean, everybody knows that. 
<laughs> can I can I follow up on that? Or you or you or you want to go another direction? Because there's a quick thing that he just said. I want to follow. No, up No, no, go ahead. And no, please follow up. On I, that. It's because it's related to the heck. It's a great point, Gerard. Yeah. But whether it's about um, you know society at large, uh, social justice, black people having the conversation won't invoke the kind of change we want. White people have to pick up this load too. We, we, we're we tasked with, with fixing a problem that we didn't that we create didn't oftentimes. Create. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I wonder That's just right. to follow up on the, on the head coaching issue in the NFL, how much are white coaches and general managers, at least to your knowledge, not only talking about this issue, but saying, hey, we need to be more intentional about this work. Or is this just B. Flo and Eric B. Enemy and Ty Bowles and Byron Leftwich and Gerard Mayo and Brother from Another? Are we the only ones talking about this? Or are white people realizing that this is a problem that we all have to collectively work to fix? Now, Within I, the I NFL say, I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I can only really speak uh, from my own experiences. One thing I will say about Bill, right? One thing I will say about Bill is that he asks questions and he understands, he knows what he doesn't know. And so he'll come to me or he'll come to other black coaches on the staff just to see how to approach certain situations, which I think that is the first step, right? And like I said earlier, we have the program where we bring in these minority coaches and things like that. But also, you also got to look at it this way. All right, he's he's tutoring us, tutoring us, tutoring us. But when is when do we get to the point where it's like, all right, now push me out the nest. Like push me out the nest and let me go fly on my own. And that to me, is the frustrating thing sometimes when you think about this. Man, I, I think, first of all, they should name you the defensive coordinator. I know you didn't get an answer. You should be the defensive <laughs> coordinator. You should name that. But uh, my, my final question is, did they, when you went on your interviews, did you feel like it was serious? Were you taken seriously? I know you crushed it, but yeah. did you feel like they saw everything that you could be as, as the face of the organization? Um... That, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. I thought they gave me a fair shot, but in saying that, I knew they had a number one guy. I knew they had a guy that they wanted to get in there, if that makes any sense. I felt like they gave me a fair shake, as fair as they could be, but they had already come to a conclusion of who they wanted in the building. And how and, and how was that when you were in the interview knowing that? How did, how did you respond to it? I mean, is that? Oh, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming 100 every time. I don't yeah. care because, like I said, it's different for me. For me, these are learning experiences for me. Yeah. For a guy like Leslie Frazier, who's done it 20 times, right? This will make you upset. Yeah. For me, I'm not even supposed to be here. Mm. I'm going to my fourth year coaching, mm. right? So I thank God every day for that. You know, for that. But at the same time. I can see the frustration with these other guys. Let me ask you one last thing. Um, it's it's a it's personal. I, I I I recognize that, and you may or may not be able to get into detail. But I'll ask it this way: If he if he has not already, if he hasn't already, do you expect there to be, or do you need to have a conversation with Bill about his role in Brian's lawsuit as it relates to the texts with Brian Dayball, Brian Flores? Do you expect to have some kind of conversation? Do you need to have some kind of conversation just about how that all went down? Just for your peace of mind as somebody still working with Bill Belichick. Yeah, you know, I would say some things don't even need to be said. Like okay. this has been going on for a long time, right? Like it's it's no secret that certain people have more influence in the league than others. Like that is, it is what it is. So I'm not sure if we'll talk about it, but I mean, we've all known it. We've all not not saying with Bill. I'm saying we've all known that yeah. you know there are some conversations and people have more influence than others. And it doesn't matter if we're talking football or whatever. Like people have influence at different levels. Did you were you uh, uh, were you surprised? Last thing for I promise. Last yeah, thing. No, we can talk were, this you, too <laughs> uh, were you surprised when uh, Brian Flores's con uh, a lawsuit was announced? Did it, did it shock you that he went that far? Not that the content doesn't surprise any of us. The step, taking that step to go at the league, did that surprise you? Um, you know, B Flo has always been one of those go getter type of guys, man. Seriously, like he's always one of those guys who's going to stand on what he believes in. It doesn't matter who's saying it, right? Above, below, your know, peers, it doesn't matter. If he believes something strong enough, he's going to go for it. And look, you know, I stand beside B Flo as far as the frustration. What I can, what, what I'm trying to let people know is that my experience has been different because I'm younger in the profession, 
And for me, I'm still in that learning phase. A guy like B. Flo, who has a track, re track record, who's done a lot in this league, a guy like Leslie Frazier, who's done a lot in this league, Todd Bowles, done a lot in this league, I, I definitely empathize and sympathize with those guys uh, going forward. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. It, it, it did. Hey, man. Appreciate you, brother, Girl, man. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate you. Always uh, great. I appreciate you Let's guys. Let's do it again soon. And proud of you, man. I'm proud of you. You're doing great you. stuff. Appreciate it, man. Talk to you guys later. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.